Hey everyone, welcome to JoJo's World. Why, hello there. Hello. Tarnished one. Yes, so we're all... I'm Liam S. Smith, one of your co-hosts. And I'm Bountine, the other one of the co-hosts. We're all very excited about the release of From Software's new opus, uh, Elden Ring. Uh, we shan't be talking any gameplay spoilers or subsequent events in that, but I will say... That Nick and... Oh, who are you? Uh, I'm, I already said I'm oh, Nick great. Valentine. But I'm oh, also... No, sorry, I got hit on the head by a coconut. Who are you? <laughs> uh, I'm Lord Dungo. So we're both very obsessed with um, a character that is named in the Elden Ring opening cutscene. We don't know anything else about it beyond their name in that cutscene. And we shan't speculate... Well, we'll speculate, but we have no further spoilers to divulge. That there is a character named the Loathsome Dung Eater. <laughs> who... His one trait seems to be eating dung. His, so like, Nick and I were both very much on our bullshit this morning, pre-podcast, mm. talking at length about the mm. life of the loathsome dung eater, uh, possibly how he could be a merchant who cooks you delicious dung yeah, in elaborate Monster Hunter-style <laughs> cooking cutscenes. Because in Monster Hunter Rise, obviously, to power yourself up, you eat dungo, mm. which is a, a yeah. traditional... Japanese like small balls of rice you put them on a stick and you're like oh rice flour I think yeah or possibly that he could be the last boss battle atop his delicious feculent pile <laughs> but it's just like the the funny thing is it's, when you it's, were... it's, it's so like I tweeted I, I made a tweet to this uh, same effect uh, mm. after we were talking so listeners may have seen me speculate this or, or observe this already this but, is why uh, we're hitting it like at the top because Dark they know. Souls 1 it's like you've got a death elemental you've got a sun god mm. you've got a chaos witch and then Dark Souls uh, Elden Ring and it's like this guy eats shit <laughs> so literally it was like you have the high priest Marcus Aurelius. Nick hasn't seen the cutscene, so yeah. he's not giving away no any idea. further names. You have the man in the golden mask who knows all. Sicreal Creed. And then this guy who literally canonically eats shit. And is defined by it. We know nothing else about him other than, his, other than that he's loathsome, which you know could be because of the dung eating or could be because of other qualities. Yeah, it's just like, oh, so hey, was he a renowned academic who went insane? I don't care. <laughs> All I know is he eats shit and that's enough for me. The other thing that we've really been on our bullshit about this morning is uh, 70s era comedic character Raymond J. Johnson I Jr. Just, just, can I? Have we talked about Ray J. Johnson on the podcast before? I think we've mentioned <laughs> okay. this guy. But you didn't tell me before that he appeared on Hollywood Square's in character, doing his bit, his bit from that shows is the entirety of his career. That is just like if anyone calls him Johnson, yep. And then he's like, "No, no, no! You don't have to call me Johnson, all right? You can call me Ray. You can call me Johnny. You can call me okay, Ray Nick, J. It's you can call me Ray, uh -huh. or you can call me Jay, okay. or you can call me Johnny, uh -huh. or you. Oh, sorry, I miss Ray J there." Ooh. Or you can call me Ray J, or you can call me Johnny, uh -huh. or you can call me Junie, or you can call me Sonny, and so on. <laughs> right, okay. But she doesn't have to call me Johnson. <laughs> so, I do not understand on multiple levels, A, how this became a thing <laughs> with him, B, how he went on Hollywood Squares with in character for that bit, right? We watched like a ten minute sketch. Where, like, he's just an asshole. Yeah, it's like a serviceable, like, early TV era sketch. Like, it's a bit slow by today's standards, but, you know, it's fine. They're doing some slapstick stuff. Yeah. And they come in and they just, like, contort the conversation around giving him the platform to do this monologue. And it's just like, I don't understand how this, like, became a thing, you know? My name is Joseph Jojo Joestar Jr. See, at least... We... Now you can call me Joe, <laughs> or you can call me Jojo, or you can call me Joey, or you can call me Jojo Joey. But you don't you have to call, call me, me Junie. But you, but don't you have... doesn't have to call me Joestar. No. Hey, speaking of people that don't have to call us by our actual names, yeah. our patrons... <laughs> Who pay us to deliver this high quality content? Well, if if they're anything like the people of the 1970s, they'll be paying top dollar for that comedic <laughs> riff. And let me tell you, the person who paid top dollar and the final person on this list... For now. For now. Or possibly ever, we don't know. Yeah, we don't care, it's fine. You could just listen to this for free, but people pay us money. And we appreciate it. Sure! <laughs> so, <laughs> so, this week is someone that I actually know in real life. Is it me? It's 
God, no. Uh. You don't pay this podcast. No. You only supply the room, the microphone. The labor. The the mice that we use to click the software that we paid for. Oh, to I thought you meant like the mice that run in a little wheel to generate power to run the computer. <laughs> <laughs> so this week's patron is Chad Kennedy. Chad Kennedy. That's Chad a, that's Kennedy. That's a fucking uh, like American protagonist name. Hey, my name is Chad Kennedy. I am a uh, Chad Kennedy. Uh, or I am here to kick the terrorists out of the uh, White House. Why is Chad Kennedy, who I assume is the president of the United States at this point? Okay, no, I've just made sense of it because he's Metal Wolf Chaos. Chad Kennedy, the president from Metal Wolf Chaos. Uh, I'm aware of the president yeah, yeah, of yeah. Metal Wolf Chaos, uh, Michael. No, uh, Myers? Richard. No, Richard no. is the vice, vice president. president. Michael. Yeah, of course. Michael, someone. Michael. Summers, Michael Myers, Michael something. Well, not Michael Myers. That's taken twice. <laughs> uh, Michael President. <laughs> uh, Michael Richard. <laughs> Michael Wilson. Michael Wilson. That's so right. we know a guy named Michael Wilson. So the fact that I know this guy in real life, this Chad Kennedy fellow, who might I add is a real Chad. Can I just say? And All a right. real Kennedy. Yeah, a real Kennedy. Well, no, okay, yeah, no, I'd pay that. Yeah, he's a bit of a Kennedy. Yeah, okay. You were saying? Um, the fact that I know him in real life makes it weird that we're doing an impression of him as a Kennedy. Okay, well, what would your impression of him be like? Um, you can call me Chad. Or, or you, you can, can call, call me Kennedy. Chaz. Or you Chaz. can call me Kenny. <laughs> or you can call me Kennery. But you don't have to call me Chad Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, he'd just be like, well, yeah, that'd basically be it, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Chad Thanks, Chad. Thank you for your support of the podcast. Nick White. This is JoJo's World, our JoJo's Bizarre Adventure recap and discussion podcast, where we recap and discuss episodes of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, part six, Stone Ocean, specifically episode seven, question mark? There's there six, six of us. us. <sighs> oh, I didn't actually pull up the episode page like I meant to. I just pulled up the story <laughs> arc page. You pulled Fool up... Fool on me. You pulled up an ad of deep fried chicken and I was like, Liam... We really got to get you some food. All right. God, now I can't get this fucking bit out of my head because of all what, these... Ray J. Johnson. Yes. Now I'm like, well, you can call me chick or you can call me fry or you can call me deep or you can call me deep sea or you can call me friesy or you can call me chicksy. But you don't have to call me. Episode seven, chick. there's yes. six of us. Yes. Covers chapters 620 through 623 of the manga. That's a very short number. Yep. Mm. Much like many of them, we generally cover three to four chapters. Hmm, I don't trust it. I don't like it. Nick, yeah. shut up. <gasps> I want to share with you some feedback from one of our listeners. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that's... <laughs> this is taking a dark turn. Okay, go on. Uh, Twitter user Fujiko Confirmed got at us in the past week. Wait, they got at us? Yeah, they got All at right. us on Twitter. Listen here, you little they fucking They came JoJo's at me world. hard and fast. Listen here, fuckheads. Something I'm surprised that you guys weren't aware of, mm. but uh, McQueen's sentencing is based on a famous fictional murder case. Oh. The JoJo version is actually a lot more tame than how deep the story goes. Oh. And we've seen things like this before, like how Yoshikage Kira's backstory was based on that, um, uh, like, licking beneath the bed myth. Oh, yeah, Urban yeah. legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but this uh, Thunder McQueen's... Uh, Backstory is based on the fictional murder case, uh, which became a bit of an urban legend in its own right, mm. of Ronald Opus. Ronald Opus? Yeah. Is that what Ronald McDonald's based off? No, but that's a real, like, Thunder McQueen-ass name, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. You can call me Ron. Oh, God. We're never going to get through this episode. <laughs> Literally every listener who's like, what the fuck is wrong with you doesn't understand the degree. Look, I recently read a thread on somethingawful.com in the post my favourite sub forum in which uh, one particular poster recently completed 100 Ray J. Johnson Simpsons memes and then ranked them. So we have been, and I say Gumming we, out, mental. Out, the inner. friends of Liam... And adjacent have been going <laughs> so insane. So the friends of Liam have been subjected to <laughs> Liam sharing a hundred times no. almost. No, I've shared almost like more, less than a dozen. Now, Liam, I can count on my fucking hand Nick, how many times. The tale of yeah. Ra of Ronald Opus. I almost said Ray J Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. 
<laughs> okay, tell me about Ronald Opus. Is this a real thing or a fictional So, thing? there's a bit of backstory. Okay. The st- story was originally told by Don Harper Mills, who was then the president of, president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, uh, in a speech at a banquet to illustrate a point regarding, like... Um, legal consequences regarding different ev- events that it could occur in a homicide inquiry. But because of, like, you know, uh, the grapevine and whatever, it took on a uh, this-actually-happened sort of ah, trait, of course. As, as things can do. Mm, in the 70s, or whenever this came to be. 1987. 1987. A mere year before the events of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 3 Stardust Crusaders. <gasps> Coincidence? Yes. <laughs> Okay, we didn't even get a chance there to... So, the story goes as follows. On March 23, 1994, a medical examiner... A medical examiner viewed the body of Ronald Opus, concluded that he died from a gunshot wound to the head caused by a shotgun. Uh, and I'll skip through, like, the, the bit of this we know, but basically the idea is this guy, Ronald, jumped off... jumped out of his building mm-hmm. uh, and was shot in the head as he was falling by someone on the ninth floor. The the twist here in this version of the story is that neither the shooter nor uh, the decedent is the word here. I don't know if that is a technical term for the deceased or the fact that he was jumping. Yeah. But whatever. Uh, Let's look up that word, actually. Let's learn here on JoJo's World, everyone. There is nothing I enjoy more than not learning on JoJo's World. And yet you force this upon me like some kind of teacher viewing knowledge. Decedent. Noun. In US law, a deceased person. Oh. Very well. Hmm. So, he jumped, he was falling, he was shot in the head, but in this version of the story, neither the shooter nor the jumper knew that a safety net had been erected at the 8th floor level to protect some window washers and that it most likely would have prevent- prevented his suicide had he not been shot. Huh. How interesting. So, ordinarily, a person who sets out to commit suicide and ultimately succeeds even if the mechanism is not what they intended, is to find it as having committed suicide. So, were that net not there, they would still consider it a suicide. But the, the wrinkle is, if the fact that the suicide would have been unsuccessful and he wouldn't have died from that, yeah. is he... A murderer? Is it a homicide? Yeah. A further wrinkle is that, uh, unlike, Alexand- uh, unlike Thunder McQueen, yeah. the shooter was not um, idly cleaning his gun, his loaded gun pointed out a window... <laughs> In this circumstance, an elderly man and his wife were having a spouse and he threatened her with the shotgun uh, and became so upset that he couldn't hold it straight. And so he pulled his trigger, intending to shoot his wife, oh. but missing and hitting the, uh, the other person, yeah, the descending up. figure. So not only was it a misintended murder, it was a murder aimed at the wrong person, yeah. which was still attempted murder. It's both manslaughter and attempted murder However, at the same time. However, the old man was confronted with the conclusion, but both he and his wife were adamant in stating neither knew the shotgun was loaded. Mm. It was the long-time habit of the old man to threaten his wife with an unloaded <laughs> shotgun. He had no intent to murder her, therefore the killing of the decedent appeared then to be an accident. That is, the gun had been accidentally loaded. Huh. Why but we- further <laughs> investigation turned up a witness that their son was seen loading the shotgun approximately six weeks prior to the fatal accident. So the investigation showed that the mother, the old lady, Mm. had cut off her son's financial support and her son, knowing the propensity of his father to use the shotgun threateningly, Uh. loaded the gun with the expectation the father would shoot the mother. Uh. The case now becomes one of murder on the part of the son for the death of the jumper. Oh. So, okay, so hang on, hang on. Okay. The son who loads the gun but doesn't pull the trigger, is tried for the murder of the person who tried to kill themselves by jumping off a building... But would have survived because of the safety net. Because of the safety net. Now, (laughs) okay, so this line... This this is an unusually dramatic line for a Wikipedia article. Mm -hmm. Now comes the exquisite twist. (laughs) (laughs) That's very (laughs) Hellraiser-esque. So, Nick, this exquisite twist... Yes? Further investigation revealed that the son was Ronald Opus himself. What? Having become increasingly despondent over the failure of his attempt to get his mother murdered that led him to jump (laughs) off the 10-storey building on March 23rd, only to be killed by a shotgun blast through a 9th-storey window. Therefore, a suicide. (laughs) So, okay. So, 
So none of this happened, right? No. Okay, but... But there's about a dozen things that have taken inspiration from this story listed here. Oh my god! So th- so this... G- okay, so this guy... This is some who- Phoenix Wright ass shit. I'm surprised they haven't worked that into a case yet. That is amazing. Like, so... Okay, so whoever made this up is a fucking genius. But the idea is that this guy... C- so... But how... He wouldn't... Okay, so he wouldn't have known that they were going to have a fight at the time. At that moment. He'd been waiting for some weeks... So he was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to kill myself. But he would have survived because of the safety net. Yeah. Had he not already it, l- loaded the shotgun. Yeah. That Teeing was... up the means of his own demise. Oh my god. God, that is an exquisite twist. <laughs> Wikipedia doesn't often tell you. Now here's the exquisite twist. And now twist. you know the rest of the story. The old man went to prison and became uh, <laughs> infected with a stand disc that weaponized his own subsequent suicide attempts. Ah, uh, there you go. <laughs> Nick, shut up. (laughs) But why? I want to share with you some words of wisdom from the creator of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Hirohiko Araki. Hit me with it. Hard and fast. From Stone Ocean, Volume 4. And you can see there's a nice little picture here of an empty set of clothes on a couch. Did Araki phase out of existence? Perhaps. Also, can we just zoom in slightly on this? How dirty is that couch? I think it's patterned. No, that's dust. Because, like, look at the uh, the pillows, right? The dust is sitting on the top, and mm. then it goes very normal red. How so... long did he disappear for? Yeah. Regarding my lack of sleep. <gasps> oh my god, it's like me! Now, that's, that's like the intro for a Magnus Archive statement. Statement of Hirohiko Araki regarding his lack of sleep. <laughs> statement begins. It seems like genetic code determines how much a person needs to sleep. Sorry, how much time a person needs to sleep. But recently, a strange event happened. Until six months before, I needed eight hours of sleep to have a clear mind. But lately, I have noticed that three or four hours are enough. I didn't want to sleep for eight hours anymore. (laughs) No, there's more. I I wanted to lean into our running joke. I didn't want to sleep for eight hours anymore, even though I knew it was bad for my health. What caused this transformation? My change of diet? My pillow? It's a complete mystery. Wait, is that it? Yep. What? No. I used to sleep a lot. Don't think I'll be doing <laughs> that anymore. So it wasn't just him being like, yeah, I don't want to sleep for eight hours. I'm just going to do three or four. I think as you get older, you become inherently less restful, don't you? Yeah. So as you get older, you need less sleep mm. because you're not, uh, I think it's like you're not forming as many connections. And, and new thus, memories and stuff. Yeah. So you don't need to really rest as much because you're not doing that much, you know? Like, you, you just kind of can stay awake much longer. Which is also why old people take naps and then basically never sleep. It's true. We've mm. all seen it. Yep. You're just always tired, cranky, and bone-ridden. Nick, Stone Ocean, episode seven. There's six of us. How many? Six. Not five? Not seven. There is a Ray J. Johnson joke here. Yep, we know there it. is. We did it before the show. We did. So to recap it would be tried. So there's six of us. There's six of us. No, there's two of them. And they're in the old shed out in the prison swamps. Yeah, the, the nebulous area that's like, yeah, there's, this place exists. So there's like farmland on the island that the prison is on that is also technically part of the prison, but is not within its walls. Yeah, so that they can um, be self-sufficient slash not have to drive food in yeah, and, and out. Yeah, and do like, often. you know, develop agriculture skills for post-release and things like that. Yeah, you know, good stuff, really. Um... I mean, you know, probably didn't need to murder people to get those skills, but yeah, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe you did. I don't know. It's hard to say. Let's just take a moment and reflect on the fact that uh, in some US states, like I believe California, you can become a fireman in prison. Uh, hmm. But because if, if you've committed a felony and been put in prison, even though you've spent all that time training and working as a fireman while in prison, firefighter, I should say. Yeah. If you're if you have a felony record, you can't become a, f- a firefighter. Afterwards. So you can, while in prison, help fight the fires. For pennies on the dollar. And then when you get out, you can't help fight the fires. No. Huh. The Punishment Ward. Jolene is talking to the little boy, Emporio. So tell me, boy, what did she know? Hermes has learned about stand abilities and she watched the McQueen memory disc and then she put it back into him and came back to life. He's not dead. Oh, he's just tied up and like... (laughs) Yeah, he's not dead. He's just sleeping. (laughs) Then we took the discs back. And uh, I hid them in my pants so she wouldn't get body searched so I could show them to you. So he's dead again. And then we'll slip it back into him in a bit. So Jolene is like, hmm. Mm. I'll watch this McQueen disc and see that 
Our man, White Snake, is hiding the discs in a tractor? Yeah, out in one of the barns or whatever. Hmm. So meanwhile, it's night. In that very same barn or whatever, two inmates are having a struggle trying to shut a door, being like, it's coming, shut the door. It's As I remarked to you, it's very much like the sort of cold open prologues shots of Jurassic Park, where like the, mm. ra- the unseen raptor has grabbed a guy and the Australian guy has him by the arm and is trying to pull him out and he's like, shoot her, shoot her. And they're like, pew, pew, and they're like, hee, hee. but he dies. Mm, it's too late. I was only trying to change the tractor's tyre. Anyway, they're trying to pull the thing back and then they realise there's a pair of severed arms on the door. And the other guy's like, no, I was the one who wasn't pulling hard enough and both his arms are gone and then a huge black mass subsumes him and then the other guy. Oh, no. And you see its eyes glinting in the darkness. And it's like... <laughs> yep. Um, and it's all very disturbed. It's like a pretty classic like horror cold open sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. It's got that disturbed look to it of like a madman made of blob, you know? <laughs> We've all been there. Yeah. Huh. And then... <laughs> yep. Nick, any observances from the opening? It's not Gwess. That's in the intro. Correct. Um, so even though I had to convince you of that again today, <laughs> literally, I was like, "So that's Gwes," and you were like, "No." I was like, "Okay, so it's not Gwes." It is, in fact, as we learned this episode, Atro, Atro, or Etro. Yeah. So very interestingly, Atro doesn't seem to last that long in this episode, mm. but we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get to that eventually. Nice of her. Nice of them to give her a cameo in the opening, given how quickly she died. Yeah, very strange. Nick, um, the warden, Loco Rocco, or whatever his fucking name was, oh, I'm not going to check. fucking warden. <laughs> Look at him. Like, that is not human. Has assembled a large group of uh, inmates from the women's prison out front. Uh, and is telling them that two inmates went missing in the swamp last night. So they're looking for a group of volunteers to... Uh, Wait, the warden doesn't tell them. Sorry, that. Charlotte Thank does. you, Charlotte the alligator. Yeah. Yep. Uh, looking for a group of volunteers who will not receive any compensation or time off their sentences to help find the bodies. They just should do it out of compassion. There's a bit of humour where Charlotte speculates that maybe they drowned in the wetlands or got bitten by a snake and Jolene's like, or got eaten by a crocodile. And then Sh- and then the one's like, hey, who the fuck said that? And Charlotte is like, I did not eat them, I'm innocent. <laughs> and then the one is like, okay, maybe I should stop using Charlotte. Yeah, it's good comedy. Uh, like, uh, Hermes, like, rolls her eyes and smirks, like, I'm not going to do this, until she sees out of the corner of her eyes that Jolene raises her hand. <gasps> Oh my god. Jolene Cujo? She doesn't love anyone. Oh my god. And yet she does this out of compassion? So Hermes is like, I need to speak to Jolene, so this seems like a good opportunity. So he's like, five is enough, let's go. Five? Oh, and Gwes is like, hey Jolene, you don't want to be doing this, you just got out of the punishment ward. And Jolene's all like, you shut your fucking face. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not... Oh yeah, she says... uh, Gwes is like, why are you doing that? And Jolene says, you won't be there. Don't like you, don't like you, Gwes. Yep. (laughs) Because that time you shrunk me. Fair enough, though, really. Yeah. If someone shrunk me, you know what I'd do to them? You'd be like, oh, I'm so small. Please don't pick me up and put me in your mouth. Why do we always make (laughs) it... (laughs) Why do we always do this thing when we get small? It's funny. Never big. Why do So, Hmm. there's this warden guy. He looks a bit like an evil Super Mario. Because he has a moustache and wears a cap. I'm glad you said an evil Super Mario. It could have been any other person in history. Or evil Freddie Mercury, because he has a moustache and cheekbones. Uh, or it could be an evil police officer. Or it could be a sort of um, dressed down, uh, equally evil Ray it. J. Johnson. God damn it. <laughs> Who also has a moustache yep. and a hat. But no cigar. No. So it couldn't possibly be Ray J. Johnson. So he holds up, um, but let's call him Ray for sake of argument to God keep things moving. It. Okay, all <laughs> Because right. we can call him Ray. Or we, we could call yeah. him Jay. Or we could call him Junie. Or we could call him Sonny. <laughs> oh, God damn it. What have we opened? What? What? Because now we're just uh, like... Much like the person who first crossbred the Labradoodle, we have opened a Pandora's box and let out a Frankenstein's monster. We have become... The people that created the pugs of Ray J. Johnson. I went to a dog beach last weekend and there were a couple of pugs there. Mm. And when it was time for them to go, one of the pugs came and stood behind us to hide. And just started like loudly wheezing. 
<laughs> Jesus <laughs> It was Christ. really cute. But I felt really bad for it because it could barely breathe. Yeah, I know. <laughs> because of the effects of selective breeding over a couple of hundred years. Oh my God. Poor Pugs, Its man. name, per the harness on its back, mm. was Pugsy. Ah. Because he was the purest of Pugs and yet never given the respect he deserves. Sure. He eats his own shit, you see. <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Pugsy shit eater. Could you imagine a Dark Souls S game about just dogs? Dog souls. Yeah, dog souls, right? Where it's just like the golden labra the no, the golden retriever, <laughs> dogzo, the black labrador, king of the cemetery, blackness oh, and is the, his name. Uh, it also represents depression, because yeah. it's a black dog. Yeah. And then this pug that eats its own shit. Yeah. Worthless crossbreed. <laughs> Oh, that's actually, actually, that's got some... Uh, that's got some protagonist vibes. Well, I was going to say, that's got maybe some uh, some connotations we don't want to delve mm, into. Maybe. Well, what am I trying to drive at? But, like, ex- what's what's a term for something that's been, like, excessively purebred to the point of degradation? Oh, there is actually a name for that. Because um, it's, like, because if you genetically select... It's the problem yeah, of, it's like, like... It's the problem of pugs and British bulldogs. Yeah, and, like, Thor from Stargate. And the English royal family. <laughs> Or Odin was from Stargate? Just gonna, just gonna sandbag that one, are you? Uh, I mean, I can't remember anything about the British royal family and bad breeding. I don't remember Rest any in of that. peace to the Queen, who is, of course, dead. Yeah. <laughs> are we talking about how she's been kept alive by machine? It's gonna be awkward if they actually do announce her death in the week between when we record this and it comes <laughs> out. But I uh, very much enjoy the joke slash conspiracy theory that she died in, like, November last year. And that she's, uh... Being kept alive by machinery. Yep. In the sense that anyway, oh, she's gone. the point is this yes. warden Ray yes. uh, announces that he has these wristbands that they've all got to wear, which is like an iron wristband oh, with the wristbands. the prison's GD yes. logo. Yes. Um, which is of course named like for, a virgin for normal reasons. Yeah. Like what? Okay. Also known as Invisible Wall. Why? Okay, so first off, why does it have two names? Two, why is one of them like a virgin? Three, why do you need to put people in a battle royale situation to go find some bodies? If you stand 50 metres away from me, you explode. If you do anything that tries to take the cuff off, it explodes. Nick, like a virgin, is of course a hit by uh, pop superstar Madonna. A diva of the time. 1985, I want to say. 1985, like a virgin for the very first time. Touched, if you will. I won't. Never touch me. (laughs) Like a Liam. Don't ever look at him. (laughs) Awesome. 1984, Nick. October 31st. 84. But the album was released on November 12th, my birthday. Your birthday's on November 12th? Shh, they'll dox me. (laughs) Yeah, on November 12th, everyone's like, happy birthday. And you're like, don't you dare (laughs) tell me happy birthday. Don't hack my my WoW account. (laughs) I don't play that game. If they're just like, wait. He plays Guild Wars. I know what we can do. We can hack his Guild Wars account. They get in, they see what you've done. They're like, wow, okay, this... Wow, well, Liam's not very good at this game at all. Jeez, He's only got like is... 30 gold. This He'll never afford deeply... a sky scale at this rate. Wow, we should really help him out. And they play for you and then buy you everything. You log back in after years and be like, I should really check out Guild Wars 2 again. Open it up, you have Here's every a item. new expansion coming out in a couple of months. It takes place in the uh, China-inspired nation of Cantha, known for its jade tech... Uh, golems and other technology. Mm, mm. Will we finally defeat the final elder dragon that threatens the uh, intelligent races of the na- of the world? No. Well, actually, we found out that that would actually be very bad, so probably not. Yeah, no, that no, of course not. Of course not. Guild what? Wars Two, a game I play every now and then. <laughs> yeah, if you get back in and you suddenly have more items than you remember, someone hacked you and loves you just a lot. Yeah, just right here. In the Guild Wars. Nick put his hand over his heart to indicate that's where the Guild Wars live. You know, hackers have such a bad rep. Guild Wars, a game that neither contains guilds nor wars, as far as I can tell. Wait, surely Guild Wars 2, sorry. Okay, yeah, there we go. Guild Wars 1, I'm sure, has guilds and wars. Guild Wars 2, they would have just been like, okay, all the guilds are now one guild and you're it. You assemble an adventurer's party, like, in the third season of the main plot. Which you technically refer to as a guild. Mm, do you fight other guilds? No. 
Do you have wars? You do utilizing... engage in wars against dragons, but so, they're not guilds. So the guilds are against the dragons? Why would you call it the dragon wars? What, or the Clone I, Wars, because um, you. Th- I always, I, hmm. whenever I play that game, just the li- the corrupted line of dialogue from Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope always just goes through my head. Luke to Obi Wan, you fought in the Guild Wars. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, like a virgin, like a virgin, touched for the very first time. Is the only line I know from that song. It's a dance song with two hooks, Nick. Her uh, in a, sung in a high register by Madonna. The song's lyrics are ambiguous, consisting of hidden innuendos and open to various interpretations. Like sex. Oh my god. The music video portrayed Madonna sailing down the canals of Venice in a gondola, as well as roaming around a palace wearing a white wedding dress. Scholars noted Madonna's portrayal of a sexually independent and strong woman, similarly of a man wearing a lion's mask to that of Saint Mark, and the link between the eroticism in the video and the vitality of Venice. Scholars? Scholars. Not academics? Scholars. Interesting. Scholars have pored over the Madonna texts. <laughs> Please, I've dedicated my life to this. I see. So you're a nerd. No, I'm a scholar. I'm a pervert. <laughs> Please, I'm not a weeb. I'm an, I'm a terrible human being. I was surprised by how people reacted to Like a Virgin because when I did that song to me, I was singing about how something made me feel a certain way. Brand new and fresh. And everyone interpreted it as, I don't want to be a virgin anymore. Fuck my brains out. That's not what I sang at all. Like a virgin was always absolutely ambiguous. Mm. Interesting take, Madonna. Interesting take. But maybe Personified consider- here as a bracelet that blows you up if you get too far away. <laughs> and then you'll feel something new. Death. Yeah. Like a virgin. Yeah, so there's this thing. You get more than 50 metres away from the warden, you explode. Um, yeah, it's a battle royale now, basically. Except without the killing. Yeah, it's just, you, you get far away, you die. It's a real squid game. So then the guy immediately gets on his, like, ATV and drives off, and they all have to run after them. So it's Jolene, it's Hermes, and, and three unseen figures, one of whom is Atro, the blue-headed woman from the opening. But if you look closely, Liam, if you zoom in slightly... On my reference images that I took as we watched... Note that... Hmm, there's, there's five of them. There's not six. But moments later, there'll be six of them. And a killer will be among them. Oh! Mm. But not among us, obviously. No, not a, no. unless... Dun, dun. I just open up and just... Blech. Nick is sus. Look, I don't trust Liam. Okay, Liam has been on my back since the start of this fucking podcast. So the fact that sus really caught on in the lexicon um, yeah. with the advent of Among Us... Uh, yeah, well, sus has always been a word. No, but like, it, there was this 2005-ish era Australian sketch comedy show featuring the likes of Dave Husey Hughes, uh, uh, Corinne Grant, Peter Hellier. Skit House, yes. yes I remember. Uh, where, like, there was a vaguely homophobic sketch <laughs> where the whole idea was that uh, two, like, fitness guru types would mm. be doing, like, really homoerotic workouts together like in a sort of an infomercial type thing and then yeah. they would turn and stare at the camera and say nothing sus, sus. yeah i remember it just reminds me of that hmm. and i wish it wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> i don't want that idea in my mind hmm. anyway <laughs> moving on <laughs> yep that is for three of our listeners <laughs> sorry he's like go search that area over there you worthless worms are you talking about in the skit, or are you talking about in JoJo's? Talking about in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. The Warden, yeah. Hermes and uh, Jolene like, find a little shack to have a conversation with and get on the same page about the whole plot. Oh, could this take a, an exquisite turn? Could this take an erotic turn? <laughs> they walk into the shed, and what do they see? And their eyes meet and they say, nothing sus. <laughs> <laughs> and then every JoJo's fan is like, <laughs> there's nothing sus, mate, there's nothing for you. But yeah. Um, Hermes is like, oh, so we've not really spoke much since, um, since the ride into the prison. Uh, Jolene, Jojo, can I call you Jojo? And she says, God damn it, Liam. we can't keep doing this. Now you doesn't have to call me Jojo. Oh, Jesus. Only my mum calls me Jojo. Now you can call me Jolene. Oh, you can boy. call me Jolene. That's it. That's it. Just call me Jolene. So Hermes is like, all right, let me ask you about some shit. But yeah, like, 
We're, we're taking a while. Let's basically just skip through this. She sees yeah. in McQueen's memories the tractor that they're looking for that has a heap of discs stored in one of the tyres. Mm-hmm. So while they're out here, they want to take the excuse to find the tractor and the discs. Hopefully it'll have Jotaro's discs in it so she can bring her dad back to life. And Hermes is like, oh, nice. That lines up with my interests of I'm not sure yep. yet. Then hard cut to some big, beautiful tomatoes. <laughs> boy, oh boy, they're shiny as fuck. And you Hermes. say tomato, I say tomato. Now you can call me tomato, <laughs> fuck or you can call me potato. You gotta let this go, okay. Liam. Uh, you gotta let this go. I'm looking for an episode title. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me Joe, or you can call me delayed episode. <laughs> then they see this huge, ominous barn. It probably shed. isn't the one we're looking for, though. Surely, <laughs> but it's it's emanating katakana. It's literally a. It's backlit. It's brightly lit everywhere. Except the lighting is on this side, and yet it's dark yeah, and so shrouded like, in mystery. Hermes is back, which is facing the same way as the barn. Is brightly lit. The, this side of the bu- the, the broad side of this barn is just dark as fuck. darkness. The warden's like, hey, you two aren't searching very hard. This isn't a fucking picnic. And they're like, oh, we're going to go take a look at that barn. Gee, Hermes sasses him. Gee, you made us run after you like that on purpose. Who's not? Who's the one having fun here? And he's like, ugh, can't have prisoners standing up to me. I'll teach her a nasty lesson with that delicious crocodile feces on the ground over there. And uh, he walks up to her and is like, oi, you. Hands off that shiny shirt. <laughs> That's mine. So he... It's really weird, right? Because we get a lot of shots of him looking at the the feces and then, he and then grins. huge grin. And I'm like, wait, does he is want he the, the feces? loathsome dung eater? Yeah, does he want it or is he? Hmm. So he slams his tonfa into. <laughs> I think they call it a baton in this context. Baton. Hey, I know what I'm allowed. Tonfa. Hmm. I wonder if there's an etymological link there. There's a ton of them. You can call me Bat, or you can call me Ton. Oh, God. Okay, I'll, I'll stop now. Unless a really good opportunity presents, it presents itself. But they're all good that opportunities. That one was, like, C+. Plus. No, that was good. That was a good one. Because we're like, what's the entomology of Baton? It's like Ton for... Etymology. Entomology is ants. Ent- and other insects. Is it? Is it etymology? Yeah. Oh, shit. Entomology is ants. Like what's in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> They just walk around being like, Hi, human, what do you want to know? That's your ant impression, is it? Well, an ant would speak much slower. I'm pretty sure an ant would just be like, Hello, we talk (laughs) slow. And? I'm not not gonna do it, but imagine an ant at that (laughs) speed. Oh, (laughs) God. Delivering the Ray J monologue. You can call me ant. (laughs) Or you can oh. call me Trent. <laughs> oh, you me because, Trent. of course, they are also known as Treants. Of course. Various. You don't have to call me Tree. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll call you Trent. Don't call me Trent. Cool. Yep. So he, he, hits her, he hits her like a virgin. Really? <laughs> no! No! It's just got. Go back to the Ray J. Johnson. Go back. I was wondering oh. if, um, like, part of the reasoning behind that name is, like, if, it, if it's a link between, like, chastity belt and... What? Oh! Like, it's a, it's, a thing, it's a thing that controls women. Oh, I get you. So, like, a virgin chast... Yeah, okay, all right. Still really dumb yeah. and probably not the reason. But if there's a through line there, I'm yeah, all for he it. He really hard and really deliberately hits her explosive bracelet with his baton. Yeah. Then he's like, oh, the stick accidentally bumped it, huh? It's beeping, like, and she's worried it's going to explode. She's apologising, like, come on, come on. I didn't mean it. I'm, I'm apologising. Be cool. Don't, don't explode me. And he's like, oh, watch out. You might blow me up too. Yeah. And eventually she trips and she sl- He's like, ha now you're going to fall on that crocodile dung. And Jolene springs into action from like tw- 10 metres away with her stand and shoots out a thread, pulls a big leaf over under... Neath Hermes, shielding her from the poop, which her weight still hits and causes it to squirt all over the guard's pants. And Hermes is like, oh, thanks for that, Jolene. Nick, we're 40 minutes into this podcast and have barely covered the plot of the episode. I want to count of how many Ray J. Johnson jokes we've made. Gonna be a good one. <laughs> um, so so they, they go look at the barn, but there's two other prisoners already there. <gasps> it's the girl with the black ponytail in the red dress 
and the girl with uh, the god eyes. Well, we can only see her from behind right now. They call her the shaved head girl pretty consistently, mm. but she's got uh, yet um. Blonde hair with a sort of um, dark brown or black swoosh at the front, mm-hmm. white shirt uh, and pink mini skirt with black tights underneath. Mm. I thought that was a jumper that she'd like oh, maybe. tied around. You could it? be right. I don't know. I'm only seeing it from behind right now. Yeah. And she's, you know, not a massively significant character, so I haven't memorised her design. I don't know. It feels, well, she lives longer than Atro, so. <laughs> True. Or is it? Ooh. So they're just like, yeah, there's nothing in here. And Jolene and Hermes are like, there's everything in that barn. Look, it's the same tractor. Okay. But before they can go look further, uh, the, the guard yeah, calls them over. He's like, we're all going to go search the wetlands now. And then we get a shot of uh, Atro and another figure. Uh, dark skinned, white hair, one of those visors on, yellow what? tank top, purple pants. I'm sorry, white hair? That is clearly purple. No, it's purple white. Yeah, purple white, okay. Purple grey, mm. you know. She's aged. And we haven't actually talked about Atro's appearance either. She wears green overall or blue, indigo-ish overalls, would you say? Teal? Uh, yeah, teal. Teal. Or cyan. Uh, it has green, a green bowl cut. Yeah, with, with uh, jagged edges in it. Yeah. A bit like that Digimon. Um, oh, that digital monster. Yeah, with the, with the bowl cut with the now, jagged edges. It doesn't edges. have to call me a monster. Oh, God. We're never going to get through it. I'm not doing it. We're not going to get through any more episodes <laughs> ever again. <laughs> This is the end of Jojo as well. (laughs) Welcome to You Can Call Us Jojo, our bizarre podcast about Ray J. Johnson. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck, I'd do that, actually. I wouldn't. It's like, who was he and why does he exist? We just don't know. Can we just do a six-episode miniseries? In which we cover every televised appearance of Bill Saluga's character, Raymond J. J. Johnson Johnson Jr., it's just, I don't understand. Neither I need I. to know. It's like an infectious meme. It's just going to boil away in your brain until you're like me. Do you think this is why that guy made those Simpsons memes? So he could just be like, I'm done with it now. And then he did one and was like, it's not gone. It's it's not gone. Hermes is starting to freak out. Yeah. She's like, Jolene, something seems off. And Jolene is still fixated on the tractor. Like, yeah, I know. If we don't get over to that tire now, we might not get a chance. But uh, and Hermes is, she's like, she's sweating. She's got her hand over her face. And she's like, don't you get it, Jolene? Something's off. There's so, six of us. And Jolene's like, yeah, there's six of us. This is getting out of hand. There's six of us. And then Hermes I'm is like... I'm seeing double. There's 12 of us. <laughs> and then Hermes is like, no, you fucking moron, Jolene. There's six of us. The warden said five would be plenty before. But there's six of and us. And we get one of those cool shots where like the screen is like... Six different panels, and one with each of their faces. We've got Black Ponytail Sporty Girl. We've got Jolene. We've got Hermes. We've got Etro. Uh, and we did, but you haven't got the photo of it. We do have God Eyes Girl. Oh, there she is. We've got, um, we've got purple white hair. And we've got shaved head, bl- eyes as black as the void. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. The despicable black-eyed dung eater lady. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to which ones we came over with. Maybe one of them has been sent here by White Snake to stop us. <gasps> Wait, but that means... They've all got bracelets on. Yeah, so that means they must be part of this whole thing. Mm. But the barn also couldn't have been protected 24-7 by an inmate. At this time, Atro is also like, Hey, something's funny. Wasn't there only five of us before? And Hermes is like, You noticed, didn't you? Yeah. And, and she... She's like, no, I can't. She's very timid. Yeah. Well, I could be mistaken. Uh-huh. Then um, Black black Void Eyes is like, No, Shaved I remember up. her. She's from the prison. Uh, she always gets bullied. She probably came out here to escape getting bullied. And Atro's like, I've never seen you before. You piece of shit. The shaved head lady is like, how oh, dare you? My eyes may be deep. Then all their bracelets start beeping. They're all panicking, like, oh, this is trouble. We're going to explode. They look over at the ATV. The driver's gone. It's covered in blood. And Jolene very seriously is like, oh, oh shit. shit. This is trouble. But it's still, they go over to the ATV, but their bracelets are still beeping. More which means and the, more. The body isn't nearby. Then Etro, who is furthest back. Mm-hmm. Um, so her name's A-E. A T R A E. Oh, in the sorry, show. you're right, yeah. Yeah. Etro. Etro, as per the Japanese pronunciation here. Etro. You come to my dinner party oh, okay. in overalls. Calm your farm. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but it was pretty good, actually. <laughs> um, she'd lingered the furthest back, and hers uh, starts to beep even more and more, and then it explodes, seemingly killing her. <gasps> well, that's a wrap on Etro. And it's just like her. Let's think back on some of our favourite Atro moments. 
Uh, can you put in the, you know that really sad song that's like... I will remember you. She said that she came here will because of the bullying. Will you remember me? She said, ooh, there's six of us. <laughs> um, she wore overalls and had a really weird haircut. Yep. She had not weird god eyes. I always, like, on, on one of my previous reads of the manga, mm. I thought perhaps that she was the s- same um, woman who was getting bullied over lending money in a previous episode. Yeah, but, but she had purple but not. hair. Mm. Unless this is the same woman and she's just dyed her hair <laughs> and changed her entire appearance <laughs> to be more of a JoJo's character. But who knows? Unless, of course, that was a manga anime difference. Let's find out. Ooh. Oh, crucially on manga anime differences, someone else, someone let me know on Twitter, mm. uh, is that uh, in the manga, uh, in the previous episode, Hermes tests her memory by remembering Mickey Mouse's birthday, not Bugs Bunny's. Ah. Nick, do you remember what Bugs Bunny's birthday was? Uh, it's July 25th? I want to say 27, but I can't remember, so don't hold me to that. Uh, 1954, I want to say. I don't think we got a year. Okay. Also, Bugs Bunny must be much older than that because 1954 is not when Looney Tunes no. came into being. So, so she explodes. She's seemingly dead. But let's talk a bit about her namesake, Etro, the fashion brand. Wait, Etro is a fashion brand? A family managed Italian fashion house founded in 1968, known oh. for its paisley patterns, which they started making in 1981. Oh, founded by Gimo Etro in Milan, Italy. Huh. I've never heard of this brand. Neither in have my I, life. but I see they do have a controversy section on their Wikipedia page. Here we go, boys! Okay. What is their wardrobe malfaction? In a 2018 lawsuit filed in the New York State Supreme Court, former Etro employee Kim Weiner alleged the company had been discriminating against employees on the basis of race, gender, and age, arguing she herself was fired after taking a stand against the company's biased practices. Interesting. So not great, but we've had far worse. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> Definitely not great, though. Man, fashion really is a fucked up industry. Seems that way, yeah. Yeah, it, pretty much everything that we've looked at, controversy. Mm-hmm. But then again, who amongst us has not done something who controversial? Who amongst us? What's your most controversial thing that you've ever done, Liam? Uh, I'm a cannibalistic serial killer. Ha. <laughs> You know, serial killers always draw in more serial killers towards them. It's like gravity. Yeah, Hannibal taught us that. It's like stand users. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. Oh. I really like that um, that tweet that's the formula for Ham- Hannibal dialogue. Let me see if I can pull that up. Have you shown me this before? Probably. On this podcast? Maybe. Like a hundred episodes ago? <laughs> Almost certainly, if, if, that, if I have. Here it is. I recently got my boyfriend into the show. This is a Reddit post. We found a standard formula of how to talk like Hannibal. Mm -hmm. Make a grandiose statement about something you are doing or something that is brought up in conversation. You know, when we make podcasts, what we're doing is we're making sounds of being alive. Then say, tell me, Will. Tell me, Will. Then state a dramatic question about how this random thing relates to Will. Does your life emanate vibrations in the air or are you stagnant? In your thoughts. So, the example they provide, a potluck is an event where individuals bring a cherished part of themselves to a communal table. Tell me, Will, what will you bring to the table? <laughs> Liam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Fred and Neil. You can call me Ray. <laughs> you can call me Jay. You can call me Johnny. You can call me Ronnie. You can call me Jonzo. Tell me, Tell Liam. Tell me, Liam. What will you call me? <laughs> <laughs> or what, what will you ask people to call you? <laughs> Ray J. Johnson, known serial killer and cannibal. Yikes. That works remarkably well. They called the dung eater loathsome. (laughs) Tell me, Nick. Mm. Will you eat the dung when the time comes? And then you always get that bit where he just looks down, he's like, "Mm, you know, I can't. And he cuts through the ambiguous meat on his plate. Yeah, and then he does a little, like, laughing smirk. He's like, well, I don't know if that's my place to say. And then, like, he makes that squishing sound. Yeah. And he's like... But if I had to, I guess I would say that. I always just think of the bit in Hannibal um, where, where um, his, his, his hunt for Hannibal, who has gone into hiding uh, in like Italy or something, Will comes yeah. to his ancestral estate and meets this Japanese woman who is like being bound to look after it. Uh, and she asks, she asks Will if, she, if he and Hannibal were Nakama, or Nakama, I suppose you pronounce Nakama. it. Nakama. Which is a term, a Japanese term that basically means friend or family that comes up in One Piece a lot. Uh, and, like, idiot translators always refuse to translate. 
Interesting. So there's just this subtitled shot of Will saying, yes, we were Nakama. <laughs> which I always find very funny. Mm. Terrible. Terrible. Anyway, uh, we're 53 minutes in and we've still barely gotten into this confrontation. <laughs> It's one of those days. It's a good day to podcast. It is a good day to podcast. It's not too hot. And it's not too not Elden Ringless today. Every minute we record this podcast is a minute that I could be playing Elden Ring. And I can't, but that's besides the point. They all run in the opposite direction of Et- Etro's explosion to find the body of the prison guard, who has died under mysterious circumstances. Uh, Hermes is like, keep your guard up, Jolene. Our enemy is among us. Nothing sus. <laughs> Can we reappropriate this joke to make it good again? Can we do that? No. Damn it. They're very suspicious of the woman with the shaved head and black eyes. And they're like, I don't like the look of her inhuman features. Atro didn't recognise her. Hmm. So maybe it's her. Maybe it's her stand. And Hermes immediately is like, yeah, it's her. 100%. It's her. So was she guarding the discs before we got here? Or... Hmm. Hmm. Then there's a wide shot where there's all this detritus on the beach next to them. And for a moment, Nicola was like, hey, what's all that? What's all that shit? Yeah, I was like, is that a treasure trove of stuff? Yeah, and you then, were like, I was like, oh, whatever. But then the bucket, which is amongst it, <gasps> makes a noise. And Hermes is like, look out, that bucket, Jolene. And she goes and uh, like, investigates kicks it, it, kicks it over. It's seemingly empty other than a small splash of water. Jolene looks away for a second. Then when she looks back, Hermes is gone and just her shoe remains. Then we cut to Hermes under the water with the bucket on her head, pulling her away. It's very bizarre. Yeah. It's, just like, it's a pretty, it's like, I think it's intended as a serious moment, but the quick cuts of it make it quite comedic. Yeah. And it's just like a, where is it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh no, the bucket. <laughs> There's no like, wait, but where's the f- and Hermes underneath is like, Jesus fucking Christ, this bucket. And she sees the little, like, she calls it a little plankton-like creature, but it's clearly like a little stand robot. Yeah. And she's see. like, oh, wait, there's this little weird plankton dude. And then it duplicates and she's like, I'm seeing double four planktons. <laughs> uh, and then it keeps duplicating until it fills up the entire bucket. And it's like, oh, wait, it was in the bucket. Yeah. And then we see outside, like, it's formed into crude hands that are, like, grasping at the bucket and her body. It rapidly, rapidly just keeps multiplying until it becomes like um, an amorphous blob Mm. that takes on a form to become morphous. She applies her stand kiss to something. I think it's arm to get out. So like it just goes whoop. I almost smacked you in the head, but yep. Yeah, I think it is to what is holding it on the bucket onto her head. Yes. And then the, the duplication f- causes it to move and split like it does, yeah. freeing her to get a crucial breath. And Jolene like, sees her. She calls to Jolene, it's not safe. They're multiplying. Don't come in the water. Just let me go. It's, dra- it's dragging her away and her wrist starts beeping. Mm. Jolene does a, like a really cool baller move. So she ties some threads to a nearby tree. Yep, and then some, uh, some more th- the other end to... A tree on the other side yeah. of the lake and forms Marsh? like a uh, a small bridge. Yeah, like a little rope bridge where there's like four strands going in the direction she wants and then crisscrossing. Mm. And then there's like a slip knot that she runs along so that it's thinner in the direction she's yet to cross and then wider behind her. Ah, that's structural integrity right and, there. And like com- conservation of resources until yeah, until you need it. And then as she's what running, we see like her body gradually unravel increasingly. And uh, Hermes is like, but if you're running that fast, isn't your whole body unraveling? And she's like, ah, yeah. I got this. And she's running and she's going to do big punchies on, on this stand, which is now fully formed into a proper stand looking thing. But it catches her fist. It's so fast. And then it amorphously, like, anti-Terminator T-1000 style, anti-blobs and then re-blobs on the other side of her to then punch her. I didn't really follow what you just said, but sure. It does what we in the podcast... Pod, the podcast parlance call a cacuene. And uh, it, yeah, just cacuene's straight Jolene. through her. Or does it? Because then she, she reveals that she's sufficiently unraveled her body that it mostly just punched through empty void, allowing her to catch its arm mid her. And Hermes is like, oh, she wanted it to punch her. She looks at the camera, she says her catchphrase, yara yara dawa. Good grief, you piece of shit. You quick quick moment to talk me. about the design of this as yet unnamed stand. Which looks like a fucking Martian and a half. Yeah, it's like a creature from the Black Lagoon robot. And then coming out of the top of its head is like a pressure gauge, oh, I think. yeah. Kind of. Or like or a, a meat thermometer. 
It's just a weird bulb on the top of like an antenna. Yeah, but I yeah. think I think it's meant to be to invoke a, a pressure gauge. Yeah, least. like a submarine. Yeah, yeah, diving. Yeah, I would have been toast if I hadn't unraveled so much. But then she does like a cool kick to like knock it into the air and then juggles it with repeated punches. Uh, and then just hits it back more. Yep. And, and then yeah. they're they're both in the water. Uh, Hermes and Jolene. They, uh, they see. They, they're too far away to make out who it is, but they see with the big hits, one of the three on the beach, or the three remaining women, staggers and falls. <gasps> Damage from the stand is reflected to the user, as we know. But first, they've got to get out of this dang water because it's reforming and coming after them. Uh, Jolene and Hermes grab... Well, Hermes grabs onto some string Jolene extends, and together they both Spider-Man shoot back towards the tree that they mm. tied onto. Like a bungee cord that you tied around a motor. And now if you say so. Now the mode is like, and you're like, okay. You know, you know when you get pulled back. On or the... like when you um when you've extended a measuring tape and then you release the catch, so it just yeah. goes. Shoop. Yeah, yeah, bungee cord. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's too fast. It's coming after them. But then Hermes reveals that she had previously stuck a sticker to its arm when it grabbed her. Uh, it doesn't appear to have three arms in this shot, but okay. Hmm. It only has two arms until it had. Three. Now she removes the sticker, kicking. Kicking it off with her uh, her foot, and the arms reform and take damage, and because they're so malleable, explode, and they are pulled to the shore. Hooray! Yay! Action! And the thing is, like, in the water. Reaching for them, but then it just, like, bitterly sinks. And Jolene's Brr. like, right, we stay out of the water, we don't die. That seems that seems pretty, yep. uh, pretty good. Jaws rules. Right? I mean, no, but yes. Stay out of the water. The shark can't get you. Yeah, but the shark eventually gets on the land, right? That's the whole plot of Jaws 2. I haven't seen Jaws 2, but... Neither have I. I'd be surprised if that is the case, given the tagline is just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Yeah, because now it comes out of the water. It's got legs. And fins. It's the apex predator. They ran over to the other three. Um, one of them, inmate FE32125, the sporty woman in the red dress, yep. is calling for help on the guard's radio. And they're like, get away from the water and don't come near us. None of you can be trusted. <gasps> All of them look suspicious. Don't try and pull anything on us. Except Atro, she's dead. Yeah, the most suspicious state to be in of all. Mm-hmm. And then Jolene's like, we need to figure out who it is because one of us... Is the traitor. It seems to get the discs. We need to defeat the user. To be continued. Hmm. Big hmm. I reckon. Well, I'll leave it for predictions, but okay. I, I think I know who it I think I know who it is. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, Nick, what are our highlights and lowlights for this here episode? My highlight is going to be Atro exploding. <laughs> that was pretty good. Because I, I was you like, didn't see that coming. No, I did not. And I was like, what? What? No, she's just dead. What? So that took me off guard, and I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, this apparently main character from the opening is dead now. I thought that was a, a nice nice surprise. Yeah. I thought that was an exquisite twist. Yeah. <laughs> we love an exquisite twist here God, on Jojo as well. Just. Also a highlight for Matt, what's his name? Opus. Ronald Opus. Yeah. Oh my god. Anyway, yeah. Uh, my highlight is... I think I thought it was really cool when Jolene did the run across the string manoeuvre. Mm. That was just a... Uh, like, Very cool thing. Yeah, and then the fact that she was unraveled allowed her to survive what would otherwise have been a lethal blow. Yeah. It's just like one of those things... One of the early examples of her like being pretty willing to throw away her own health in the pursuit of cool manoeuvres. Which is the true Jojo way, of yeah. course. Yeah. It's especially the Jolene way, as we'll come to see more and more. Mm, excellent. Ah, uh, lowlights. Warden! The Warden! Yep, fair. Why? Why I does he look like that? You know your distaste for the Warden? Oh. Like, okay, so I'm getting used to it, but at the same time, it's truly disturbed. Like, what is the bone structure of that man? Does he even have bones? Too many, I might say. Is that a fin? Is that all just ligament up there? Cartilage. Oh, I don't know. Is it a reference to Griffith from Berserk? Probably not. But what if it is? I don't know. My low line is probably, I feel like we probably spent too long on like the extended crocodile poo prank sequence. Yeah, that was a bit shit. Like I guess it's meant to be these two bonding in adversity of this asshole. And also so we don't feel too bad when he dies moments later, but... But it's still a bit like, uh, yeah, okay. We, we don't really give a shit about you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Rough. So, Nick. Yes. The uh, warden we have nicknamed Ray, not the warden, the guard, uh -huh. that we have nicknamed Ray, is dead. 
uh, but his like a virgin remains an active th- complication slash threat. Mm-hmm. There are five of us because one of us is dead. Yep. Um, uh, and w- one of the, or, you know, unknown party or parties mm-hmm. uh, is puppeteering this plankton stand to pick us off one by one. Mm. And we've got to get these discs out of this tractor. What will happen next time on JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, part six, episode seven, I think. Uh, Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters? Foo Fighters. Oh my god, we're actually getting to references that I know. Um, so I think it's not the lady in the red okay. with the black ponytail. I don't think it's her. She's not sus to you. Yeah, I also don't think it's God Eyes Lady. Uh because she... The one our protagonists are most suspicious of currently. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it's her. I think it's purple hair, white hair lady. Yeah, she was the last to explicitly appear. Yeah, so I reckon it's probably her. Also because uh, when we look at the image of like, oh my god, they moved. I think it was because they were reaching down for the warden's body. And not because it was a reaction. Wait, who moved one? You know when, um, was it Jolene or Hermes looked over... And the silhouette moved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I reckon, because that lines up with uh, with red shirt, black hair lady. Now, this could be an ambiguity of the animation, but they did sort of sway before they went down. Mm. Yeah, I reckon... Mm, I, don't, yeah, I don't know. I reckon that would just be like, oh, they're just leaning down. It's a red herring? Yeah, I think it's a red herring. Okay. Yeah. I think the real stand user is either A, the warden, who is still alive. Wait, do you mean the warden warden or this guard? I mean the, the guard, okay. not the warden. Jesus Christ. Don't bring the warden back into this. It's Charlotte's um, stand. Good Charlotte. <laughs> oh, terrible. Um, yeah, so it's either going to be this guard or it's going to be uh, someone who's currently in the barn who was mm. hiding the whole time. A seventh one. A seventh. Yeah, now there's six of us. <laughs> um, and they will... Be caught out, but then the whole problem is, well, how do we reach them? We can't move away from the warden. Guard. The the guard. <laughs> yeah. And then they can't just throw the body. It's too heavy. Mm. Mm. So And what yeah. do you make of um the fact that Atro, dearly departed, is still in the opening? I don't understand why like does she come back? Is her whole stand power that she's like, oh yeah, I just come back every now and then. <laughs> and it's like, but you died. It's like, yeah. That happens a lot. I'm like, Kenny. I get shanked a lot in prison. <laughs> yeah, it's like, she's like Kenny from South Park. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I died. It's like, oh, how'd you come back? I don't know. <laughs> That's it. And then she'll grow control of her power, which will be, I don't know, immortality. Sure, yeah. Yep. Um, cool. Yeah, I reckon maybe that's just her stand power or... Um, I was building an elaborate yeah. scenario in my head where they found her like actually bleeding out or something and I used the stickers to like duplicate her blood so she has more until the EMTs get there. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's like, what did you duplicate? We duplicated every part of her and now we have a Frankenstein's monster ah. in outro. <laughs> and that's what we see in the opening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think she just... Her stand power is just, yeah, I came back from the dead. Cool. But it's like after a certain amount of time or something. Well, we'll find out what happens with that next time on JoJo's World. I'm still planning on making my way through the uh, outstanding correct Utena predictions. Mm -hmm. But our last couple of episodes have been running long, so we'll get to that when we do. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, of course, we're JoJo's World, a podcast about uh, Ray J. Johnson mostly (laughs) these days. If we actually... Okay, we should absolutely do... A mini podcast series. Look, um, look, look, look at me. Look at me. I'm looking at you. Yeah, yeah. I refuse. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> oh, one day. One day. But until that day, to, to be, be continued. continued.